Well, good morning. Welcome to Christ Community Church. We're so glad you're here with us today. Now, I've, I've got to tell you, last week one of, the, one of the kids came up to me after church and said, when, when, I, when I grow up, I'm going to give you some money. And, you know, he, he kind of caught me off guard. But, but I said, well, well, thank you. Why are you going to give me some money? He said, because my dad says you're one of the poorest preachers he's ever heard. <laughs> Seriously, I was, I was just kidding, but I read that in a pastoral leadership thing, and it, was, it, was, it made me laugh. So, <laughs> just wanted to get that out there. This morning, we're starting a brand new message series entitled, the, the Light Has Come, as we rejoice in the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so if, if you have your Bible, open it to the Gospel of John at chapter 3, because this, this passage of Scripture is, is a theme behind this series. However, there was a time in the world when it, it seemed as if there, there was no hope. The prophet Amos foretold of a time of, of spiritual famine when there, there would be no prophet in Israel and the people would be, literally, they would be cut off from, the, from God's voice. He said in chapter 8, verse 11, speaking for the Lord, he says, The days are coming when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Many centuries later, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, broke that 400-year period of silence when he prophesied in Luke chapter 1 that the, the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Now, Zechariah certainly compensated for his, sil for his silence as he announced the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was bringing light, life, and peace into the world. It was the dawn of a new day. The God's, God's tender mercies were, were rising, and the, the light was coming into a spiritually dark world. The people were sitting in darkness and death. Distress had gripped them, and the Bible describes mankind's condition without Christ in Romans chapter 1, saying that although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so darkness plagues the earth because people refuse to come to the light. The light has come, but even today, unbelievers continue to live in darkness with frustration and vanity as they attempt to find purpose in life without God. Day in and day out, they seek to satisfy their fleshly appetites. They seek fulfillment but are never satisfied. It's only as they come into the light of Jesus Christ that people can see themselves as they really are, as sinners who are, are sick, that are hurting and, and in desperate need of a Savior. It's only as His light is allowed to penetrate their hearts that the darkness is chased away, sins are forgiven, and the death sentence is lifted. If you found your place in your, in your Bible, look at John chapter 3, verse 19. This is, this is the theme behind this series and the apostle says, verse 19, the light has come. The light has come into the world. But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. It will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. And so the light has come. And yet darkness has blinded mankind. Jesus' identity is shrouded in mystery, his name beyond understanding. And still the scriptures are full of vivid descriptions. From cover to cover, the Bible answers the question, who is the Messiah, the light of the world, the, the Savior Jesus? The Apostle John tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning... In Genesis, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the creator God. In Exodus, he's the redeemer. In Leviticus, he's your sanctification. In Numbers, he's your guide. In Deuteronomy, he's your teacher. 
In Joshua, he's your conqueror. In Judges, he's your victory. In Ruth, he's your kinsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, he's the root of Jesse. In 2 Samuel, he's the son of David. In 1 and 2 Kings, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. In 1 and 2 Chronicles, he's your intercessor and high priest. In Ezra, he's your temple. In Nehemiah, he's your protector. In Esther, he stands in the gap to save you. In Job, he's the arbitrator. In Psalms, he's your song. In Proverbs, he's your wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's your purpose. In the Song of Solomon, he's your lover. And in Isaiah, he's everything you need. As a matter of fact, the description that God gives to the prophet Isaiah is so powerful. This description is so beautiful that we're just going to camp here for the next couple of weeks. Isaiah says this in chapter 9 at verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. The spirit of the living God speaking through the prophet Isaiah describes a son, a child that will be born, whose name will be the Wonderful Counselor. And I just want to stop there and focus on this name because this name literally means beyond understanding. It's just too wonderful for words. That's, that's what Isaiah was saying as he was describing the Messiah. He didn't have words to describe him because there were, there were no words that were great enough. He was just too wonderful for words. You see, Jesus is our wonderful counselor because he's the only one who truly knows you. He's, he's the one who cares for you, and therefore he's the one who knows exactly what you're going through. That, that's how Jesus is described in Hebrews chapter 4 at verse 15. The author, directed by the Holy Spirit, said that we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus, our Savior, has been there and done that. He's been through what we, we're going through. He's, he's been tempted in every way just as we were. He understands your pain and your hurt because he's experienced life just as you have. That's why this promise in Hebrews chapter 4 is so important. Verse 16 says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is such good news because at one time or another, or maybe multiple times, each one of us has found ourselves in that place where we, we have experienced a time of significant need. And yet the scripture tells us that Jesus, the wonderful counselor, is here to help us. You see, when Jesus came, he came for those who were in need. He came for the, the sick. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that when Jesus called a tax collector named Matthew to be his follower, he actually he caused quite an uproar because everybody knew that tax collectors were corrupt and far from God. The religious people, the Pharisees and, tax, and the teachers of the law, questioned how Jesus could even hang out with sinners like these. And they complained in Luke chapter 5 saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answers them and said, he's, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so the question I want you to consider this morning is, where are you sick? Where are you hurting? Because the good news is that Jesus came for the sick and the hurting. And so I want to give you three principles that we need to embrace to experience the fullness, the completeness, and the entirety of healing that our wonderful counselor wants to bring into our lives today. The first one is that we need to be honest with Jesus. We need to be honest with him. Because truthfully, so many of us aren't. We're just, we're just not. As a matter of fact, there's a story in John's Gospel about a, a woman who's like many of us. She, she'd gone through life, as most of us do, simply wanting to be loved and accepted. And accepted. She thought, as many of us do, that if, if she just found the right person, then, then life would truly have meaning. And so she, she made some bad choices, like, like many of us do. And, and she had gone through one relationship after another, but eventually, she, she gave up on marriage and moved in with this guy. John tells us in chapter 4 that one day she had encountered Jesus and was, 
She was just captivated by the depth of his understanding and his compassion. And so she, she was having this really deep conversation with Jesus at the well when he asked her this serious question. Now, she could have done what many of us would have done in her situation and lied, but instead she, she told the truth, and therefore Jesus was able to go deeper and to address her, her real spiritual need. In verse 16, he told her, go and call your husband and come back. He told her, I'd, I'd like to talk to your husband too. Now, she could have easily lied and said that he was away or that he wasn't available, but she chose to be honest. And verse 17 said, she said, I have no husband. Jesus replied and said, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you're with right now isn't your husband. What you said is quite true. And so because she was honest, maybe for the first time in a long time, Jesus was able to reveal his identity, that he was the one that she'd been searching for all of her life, and, that he, and she was able to recognize him as that living water that she needed. And there are some of you here today that are in that very same place. You've been searching and searching, and may, maybe you've prayed and prayed, and you're not sure what the answer is anymore. Others of you need, you need to be honest about where you, where you really are hurting. Maybe in your marriage, maybe in addiction or anxiety, uncertainty or, or insecurity. But whatever it is, you need to be honest with Jesus this morning. You see, he's that wonderful counselor. And so we need to learn to be honest about our sickness. There are some of you that just need to be brutally honest with Jesus today. Brutally honest and just say, Jesus, I, I need your help. I need your help. The Bible says it this way in 1 Peter. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And so we can cast our cares on the wonderful counselor because he'll sustain us. He won't let us fall. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so the first thing is that we need to be honest with him. And then the second thing is that we must learn to listen to him. In fact, look, look, at, look at God the Father's advice to Jesus' disciples in Mark chapter 9. It tells us in verse 2 that Jesus took, to, took Peter, James, and John and, and, and led them up on a high mountain. In that place, they were all alone with Jesus, and there he, he transfigured before them. He changed before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than in, anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And so God here did this incredible miracle. Jesus was changed before them into the splendor of all of his heavenly glory. It was beautiful. The, the, these two ancient dead guys were there, appeared before them, and, and, and the disciples were ready to set up tents, build an altar, and, and worship when God spoke to them. And here's what God said in, in verse 7. God said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Listen to him. And I'll tell you, if there's anything that God would say to the church today, it's listen to Jesus. Listen to his voice, because the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 1 that in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son. Now you may ask, well, how, do, how does Jesus speak? How does Jesus speak to us today? And, and I'll tell you, he speaks just as God would speak, any, any way he wants. He speaks to us in many ways. That's, that's just one of the benefits of being God. He may speak to you through, through his word in the Bible. He may speak to you through my words. He, he may say something specifically to you. He may speak to you through the words of a song on your way home this morning. He may speak to you through a daily devotion. But if you listen... You can train yourself to hear his voice. You see, Jesus said that you will know his voice. You'll, you'll know the voice of your wonderful counselor. John chapter 10 records it, Jesus saying this in verse 27. He says, my, my sheep listen to my voice. He said, I know them and they follow me. And so number one, we've got to be honest with the counselor. 
We've got to listen to him, number two. And then number three, above all, we must do what he says. When he speaks, we must do what he tells us to do. Obeying, even when we don't feel like it, even when we don't understand. Because we don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes we wonder why we don't hear from God. And oftentimes it's because we've, we've quenched the Holy Spirit, because we haven't done what he told us to do. And he's not going to keep telling us to do something if we won't do what he told us to do already. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Other translations say don't, don't quench the Spirit. You see, because of disobedience, because of stubbornness, because of sin, we can silence the voice of God. We can quench the Holy Spirit, and we don't want to do that. We want to do what he says, and honestly, sometimes Jesus will ask us to do things that just, just don't make sense in our natural minds. But the Bible says, don't, don't treat prophecy with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. And so we need to test everything according to the word of God and the will of God because Jesus may ask you to do something that just doesn't make sense. But you do what he says because he's your wonderful counselor. Because you know he's speaking into you what is best. He's speaking what is true. And so you can believe it, you can take it to the bank, and you, you need to obey. In Mark chapter 10, there's an example of a, of a guy who didn't do what Jesus told him to do, and, and, and it, it cost him more than he ever could have imagined. If this had happened in, in our, our day, this, this would be the guy who was all into his image, all into his stuff, and so much so that he wouldn't fully surrender to Jesus because the things of the world were, were too important to him. The Bible says that Jesus had been teaching the people. And as he, just as he was preparing to move on, he, he'd been teaching there all day. He, he was preparing to move on. And verse 17 says that at this point, a man ran up to him. At that last moment, he ran up to him and fell on his knees before him, saying, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? Jesus replied in verse 19, he says, You know the commandments. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. I mean, don't, don't lie. Do not, do not defraud or cheat somebody. Do, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at this guy he looked at this guy's sin. He saw his sickness. He knew his love for the things of the world. In verse 21, he says, verse 21 says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. He looked at him and loved him. Because he loved him, he told him something he didn't want to hear. And sometimes because Jesus loves you and I, he may tell us something that we don't want to hear. You know, maybe, maybe you're in that place where you're feeling safe and comfortable, but he's asking you to change. Maybe he's asking you to get out of that relationship because he loves you. Or maybe you've made some bad decisions, the consequences are going to hurt, and you, and you don't want to hear that but he's going to tell you because he loves you. Others of you, you've got some secrets. You know, there's, there's things that nobody knows. He's going to tell you to get it out in the open, to be real, because he loves you. And he's your wonderful counselor. And so Jesus looked at this guy and he loved him. Look what he said in the last part of verse 21. He said, one thing you lack Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. In other words, Jesus said, go, go sell your house, your cars, your clothes, all your stuff. Go sell it all. Go sell it all, then come follow me. Verse 22 says that this, the man's face fell. He went away sad 
because he had great wealth. Disheartened by these words, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Because his stuff had too much of a grip on him. He was unwilling to do what Jesus said. He was unwilling to obey the words of the wonderful counselor. And this morning, if you and I are not willing to do what he tells us to do, you and I will continue to live an unfulfilled life. Continue to live breaking the heart of God. When the wonderful counselor speaks, you need to do what he says to do. Because he's so wise, so powerful, so full of understanding that there aren't even words to describe him. As we close this morning, I want to encourage you to be honest with him. To listen to him. And to do what he says. Let's pray together with heads bowed, eyes closed, taking that posture of prayer that we know so well, that we, we, we love and we long, long for. Father, we love you because you first loved us. We thank you for sending our wonderful counselor. And truly, we repent for complicating and confusing something that's really so simple. That we would just be honest with you that we would listen to you and that we would do what you've said. Sometimes it's just so hard to receive because it's just too easy. Help each of us today to trust you, to be real with you and to be sensitive to your voice, doing what you say. God, we thank you for your mercy. And we ask in Jesus' name that you would change us completely and forever by your grace. As we continue in prayer today, we're, we're going to prepare today to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, to have communion, fellowship with one another. And so we're going to examine ourselves as Jesus tells us. And maybe you're sitting here this morning, you're a committed follower of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you through his word, through his message today. And you're, you're recognizing you haven't been completely honest with him. You haven't been leaning into him and listening. And you haven't been completely faithful in doing what you know he says to do. And so the cry of your heart this morning is, God, forgive me. I know that I'm loved and I, and I repent. I want to live in a life of obedience as, as a response to your loving grace. If that's your prayer this morning, would you just raise your hand and acknowledge that before God? I know, I know my hand is up. Father God, I, I, we repent of our sin, our stubbornness and our self-centeredness. We ask that your grace would overwhelm us, that it would change us that it would compel us to live the rest of our lives as a response to your grace, the undeserved gift through the cross and the death of your son, Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you that it's your character to love, to give grace. And so we thank you for all that you've given to us. As we transition together into celebrating the Lord's Supper together, We could continue to pray because there are those here in this message today and you know that there are things in your life that are, are really not marked as uh, characterized by submission to God maybe today you've heard the story of this woman at the well and it, or, or the, this, this rich young ruler and there were things that connected, but there maybe, there, maybe there were things that seemed totally foreign to how you live and what matters to you. And yet, for, for many of you, for many of you right now this morning, you're on the throne of your life. Life is about you, about your ambitions, your goals. And I want to assure you that it's not going to work that way for long. You see, the truth is that we've all missed the mark. Every single one of us has sinned. We've, we've fallen short of God's standard. And, and the bad news is that the penalty for our sin is death, eternal separation from God. But the gift of God, the good news is that while you were still sinning, while you were still being rebellious, 
Jesus died for you to make a way for you to have a restored relationship with God. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is, what, what, what do I do? What do I do? Just, just like that rich young ruler came and fell at Jesus' feet. What, what do I need to do? And it really comes back to our message today. Number one, you got to get brutally honest with God. Number two, you listen to him. And number three, you do what he says. And so you surrender, you give up. You admit that you sinned against your holy God. You confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. You submit to him and you allow him to take his rightful place in your heart on the throne of your life. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. When you do that, the Bible says that you'll be saved. You'll be forgiven and you'll be made forever new. Your life is now characterized by repentance from those things that you did that were wrong and choosing to live in obedience to God. Yeah, but the thing is, it's not enough just to know that. It's not enough just to know this but you need to receive it for yourself because it involves an action of the heart and the will. It's kind of like Christmas morning and there's this this present under the tree. It's got your name on it, but it's not truly yours until you you reach out and, and, and grab a hold of it and open it up and enjoy it. God's grace has been extended to you. The gift of forgiveness is in his hands. It's right there before you. The question is, will you make it yours? Will you open that gift this morning? And will you use it as you give your life to God, to our God who gave his life for you? If you will, he'll transform you. He'll change you, setting you on a course for heaven and using you to impact all this for Jesus. Those of you this morning that don't know him in that way and you want to. If you would say, God, I'm sorry. I need your grace. I I need you to forgive me. Today I turn away from my sin and I want to follow you with all of my heart, all of my mind, and all of my strength. If that's your desire, if that's your prayer, I want you to boldly raise your hand right now. I just I want to meet with you eye to eye. If 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 your prayers this morning, I'm sorry, Jesus. Forgive me. I surrender. If that's your prayer, just lift your hand to heaven right now and acknowledge that before God. Just acknowledge that before God. God bless you. God bless you. I see you. Now as we celebrate together communion, remember the Lord's Supper, all of us come to the table together. It's a church together, each one of us together. When we come to this place of surrender, saying, God, I give you everything. I surrender my life to you because you surrendered everything for me. And what I'd like for us to do all of, is all of us praying together, praying for, with those who've made a decision to say yes to Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. Praying in agreement with our brothers and sisters in Christ, everybody out loud. Heavenly Father, I admit that I've sinned. I'm asking you to forgive me because Jesus died in my place. Jesus died for my sins. And I believe, I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. He's alive now. He's with you in heaven. And I receive his gift. I receive your grace and I give you my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can serve you always. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody agrees saying amen, amen.